Tom Whitehead is the kind of person that you think of when you think of a, a Louisiana legend. I think Tom was a great professor. I think he was a great uh, person who really, really enjoyed his job. Mr. Whitehead has spent the vast majority of his life uh, promoting Clementine Hunter's artwork, uh, educating others about her artwork. On December 29, 1946, Tom was born the only child of Grace and R.T. Whitehead. He was raised on a cattle farm in the small community of Pride, Louisiana. He still goes back to Pride, even though Pride is hardly there these days. He still goes back there and has lots of friends. Friends from elementary school remain friends of his. Tom graduated from Northwestern State University with a degree in political science and a minor in communications. During the height of the 60s protests, Tom headed to Boston University to obtain a master's degree in public relations and communications. Tom's experiences in Boston forever shaped his life, but Louisiana was still home. In 1969, Tom returned to begin what would be a 30-year tenure as a professor of journalism at Northwestern State in Natchitoches. He poured himself into his students. Some students would come to the university not knowing which direction in life they wanted to take. He spent a lot of time with them. Some of them went on to become important in business and so forth, many just to have a good job and a good life as a result of meeting Tommy. He was just a guy who literally um, sowed seeds into his students, especially if he saw something in you. I think that Tommy had uh, a, a big thumbprint on what I did post-Northwestern. The most important relationship Tom formed, however, would be with Clementine Hunter, the folk artist who lived and worked picking cotton on Melrose Plantation in the Cane River Valley. The best thing that I remember about Tommy was him giving me the opportunity to go and meet Clementine Hunter and uh, take her paints. Clementine Hunter produced thousands of paintings that documented black Southern life in the early 20th century. And for almost 60 years, Tom documented Clementine Hunter's life, co-authoring several books, including her biography, and co-producing several documentaries about her. Tommy brought his innate sense of passion for history and for preservation to anything that he encountered from the very first foundation of his encounters with Clementine. So he was from the naturally from the very beginning, documenting, collecting things. And as a journalist, as a professor of journalism, he was paying careful attention to the integrity of facts. Tom's weekly visits with Clementine Hunter became some of the most defining moments in his life. And it helped bring her work into the spotlight. Tom also played an important role in protecting her work from forgeries. My first encounter with Mr. Whitehead was when I started a fraud investigation uh, involving uh, art forgeries made in the likeness of original works by the Louisiana folk artist Clementine Hunter. Mr. Tom Whitehead was invaluable uh, as far as educating me as to the history of Clementine Hunter, the artist, her art techniques, how she painted, the materials that she used, uh, and why her artwork was so collectible and important, uh, to, not just to Louisiana, but to the entire world. One of the things that he did that was very important for her art was that he, that he helped to establish a standard for authenticity. A clear sense of authenticity enabled individual collectors and museums to purchase work and to display work with confidence. Tom Whitehead's advocacy for Clementine Hunter has protected and shaped her legacy, creating his own legacy that will last for generations. As Clementine Hunter's individual works begin to be acknowledged in a deeper way, Tommy Whitehead will always be cited for his lifetime successful efforts in bringing Clementine Hunter's work into the limelight. The education he provided me, the inspiration, I would never be in the position that I am today had it not been for Tom Whitehead, period.
Thomas Whitehead, Louisiana legend, 2022. So very glad to be in your home here in Natchitoches. It's really a pleasure for us, myself personally, and Louisiana Public Broadcasting to be here to have a deeper conversation about your life and your contributions to Louisiana. So first I'll start with the first question that we have for you today, which is, tell us about your childhood. I was an only child. I lived on a farm in the country. At, my address was Zachary, but I lived in a community called Pride. I had my graduating class at Pride High School, but there were 32 students in our class. It was a small class, and uh, it, was, it was a small community. But I had no neighbors. I lived on a farm, so it was, it was kind of isolated in a way. The only community I really had was either going to church some or else at the school. So growing up in the community of Pride, the small community of Pride, what did that uh, do for you in terms of your uh, trajectory in life? With only a small class, I got to know individuals. I got to see, you know, idiosyncrasies. I could had enough understanding. I could see bright kids. I could see kids that were athletes. I could see the diversity in a small group of different types of characters and pe people. And I kind of learned to like that. I came here, I graduated in three years from Northwestern with a degree in political science and a minor in communications. And then I decided to get a master's degree at Boston University. I got a degree in communications from BU and I was there at a great time. I was there in the late 60s when all the war protests and all that craziness, they closed the school down for protests and everything. And I lived in a perfect part of Boston. I lived directly behind Fenway Ballpark. I lived under the Sitco. If anybody watches baseball, yeah. you'll see the Sitco sign. I lived at the base of the Sitco sign. And every night of my life in Boston, the mm -hmm. colors changed on the blind of my window with that colors of the Sitco sign. So that's my memory of Boston is every night seeing the Sitco sign color. And I go to ball games at Fenway, I always look at the Sitco sign. Yes. So let's talk about your relationship with Clementine Hunter and how important that was to your life. Clementine Hunter's story starts as a very interesting, I have a beginning to the story. I was I, at Northwestern, I had a job in the TV studio as a student worker. And I helped at that time, Oral Williams was teaching developmental English on TV. She had been to Columbia College in New York to learn how to teach develop. They were doing testing on could you teach developmental English on closed circuit TV. And she, back then we didn't have electron, tr electronic graphics. We had sentence strips, which you put words and verbs and stuff. And I was probably the only kid in the studio that could follow her lecture and put the right sign up when she said, put the sign up. So we became friends as I was her student worker. And one afternoon she said, I've got to ride out to Melrose to see Francois Mignon. Would you like to ride with me? And I said, yes, it was an October afternoon. And I did. And we stopped, she stopped by Clementine's. And Clementine was in the yard painting a picture. She was painting a picture. I bought my first painting that day. And Amen. then I'll uh, we'll go over to Francois's place. I met Francois Mignon at Melrose. Those two that afternoon really had a lot to do with shaping my life, meeting those two people, Francois and Clementine. So Tom, how did you discover her work? I know this all started with a chance ride out to, to Melrose, but how did you really get into discovering her work and really promoting? Well, of course, I told you that I uh, went out in the, out there with a the teacher and we visited her and then went across the road to meet Francois Mignon at Melrose. And those two people are really the, Francois was the one that really discovered Clementine, and he was a writer, had a column, and he promoted Clementine in writing. And there were other people, Carolyn Ramsey from New Orleans photographed her, and Lyle Saxon wrote about her. So there's a lot of people writing about Clementine. The stories were there, and Clementine actually was the character that was the real person in those stories. So she was a real person that had been documented by prominent Louisiana writers at that time. And so even getting into her art, what, what really motivated you to capture those pieces uh, and see it for what it was, even though they, were, she, though they were writing about her, but the art side of what she was doing. I saw her work really in two categories. One was she was documenting a way of life on the rural southern plantation that disappeared. When mechanization came to agriculture in the 19, late 40s, 50s, the jobs for people working on the plantation disappeared. And that's when the community changed. It used to be all the people picking cotton, machines picked the cotton. All of the other jobs in the plantation went away. They, the great scenes of hers painting wash day scenes. Well, everybody had washing machines and that went away. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of uh, activity she documented from that insider's perspective. Absolutely, so any, any key lessons you've taken from your relationship with her and the art? I learned a lot about creativity that she, and, you know, she had no education, but she had in her a mental awareness, a, a cuteness, that made her capture these pictures. And many of these pictures, if you know some of the details, and I'm worried, because some of the characters and pictures in these paintings, mm -hmm. we know who they are. 
but the next generation is not because we heard Clementine tell us the story of them, who the people were and why they were in the picture and all of this. So that has gone away, but her paintings still document a way of life from that insider's perspective that disappeared. It absolutely disappeared. So, Tom, you advocated for her as a black woman during a time of tremendous racism. What was that like to, to do that, as obviously as a, a white gentleman? Well, actually, with the arts, I think it was more accepting. Mm -hmm. Because they, they, they didn't just look at her as a, you know, a fine artist, but they saw her as documenting this lifestyle. And people, the purchasers of the art, were people that had seen this in their life or been a part of it. So she... Uh, she met a, a documentation. She documented a lifestyle that disappeared. Documenting the, the lifestyle that disappeared. Yeah. But even you promoting that work and advocating for her in, in museums and areas where her work, where she couldn't go, but her work would, right, be, right. would be placed. Yeah. What was that like? Well, I was not here then, but when they had the first exhibit of her paintings at Northwestern here in Natchitoches, mm -hmm. she couldn't go in the white daytime because they were not allow black people. So for, they had to take her up there on a weekend or weeknight or something to take her up there to see her paintings hanging because of segregation. That's a dramatic story. That is a dramatic story. And I would think for her, did she share that, what that felt like for her? I don't know. She was not very articulate about something like that. It was on a Sunday afternoon they took her to the Hanchi Gallery up on the campus at Northwestern mm -hmm. and showed her. She just, they said, I was, of course, not there then. It was in 1952, I think. That she just looked at him almost stunned that there were people looking at her paintings. These were her paintings and everybody were looking at was looking at them. That's dramatic to me to think an artist didn't understand that people, she wasn't aware of what they meant to people. Yeah, that's something to go through life and, and, and even now we're looking back on her work and how celebrated it is and for her not to really appreciate it or have that same level of, um, of, of concern for it. So you worked with the FBI to actually protect her work from forgery. Why was that important to her legacy, uh, especially for you? Well, it's especially important to me because a group of us that were friends and stuff, Clementine collectors, realized what was happening. There were forged Clementines being sold in galleries all over Louisiana mm -hmm. and Natchitoches and New Orleans. But we couldn't figure out, you know, you, to, to prosecute in a forgery case, you got to know who painted the pictures or something about them. Sure. And us saying they're fake doesn't mean they're fake in many people's eyes. So. Um, I finally had a friend of mine that was in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Shreveport. I called him. I said, Alex, we have a, some art forgery cases. He said, it's very, and we have lots of documentation, mm -hmm. but nobody will take, we've been in the sheriff's, we went to the sheriff in East Baton Rouge, all these places. Nobody would take the case, and we think the reason why they didn't know what to do. And uh, Alex told me, I have a young FBI agent in Alexandria, Louisiana, Randy Deaton, and you give me some time. I got a case going on. Give me about a month, and I'm going to call you, and I'm going to come down and visit with you. In that month, I produced a loose leaf binder about the eighth, about six, three inches thick of all the paperwork and pictures and everything. And they came sat at my dining room table and uh, Alex took it back to Shreveport, Alex Van Hook took it back to Shreveport. Mm -hmm. And about a month later, he called and said, we're gonna take the case. And that opened up a whole new world of art integrity, not just of Clementine, but in the whole underserved, uh, primitive self-taught artists. They'd never prosecuted, nobody wanted to fool with it. So that, that the landmarkness of that case is the fact that we're protecting art, not the fine arts, but people that are home, you know, folk art and people that are the smaller communities that are not in part of the mainstream of art. So how, is, how difficult is it to actually detect the forgery in Clementine's work or maybe even the folk art in general? Well, you have to have somebody who knows the artist. Mm -hmm. Uh, I couldn't do other, other folk artists, but I can do Clementine, but there are certain techniques. I hesitate to tell some of them, okay, but I know, I'll understand. tell you, I'll tell you one thing, just an easy example of it, is that Clementine always took a pencil and marked her, she drew the board, she called it marking the board, the people, the cotton, whatever, she marked it with a pencil. And the forgers didn't do that, they just painted the picture. Ah. And when you, and you look always, you should look at, you look at pencil marks. And those pencil marks are an indication that Clementine painted them. Now, sometimes they're hidden by paint, but if you look everywhere on the board, you'll see some pencil marks. Right, right. I'm glad you were able to pre help preserve her legacy, and, and clearly that's important to you that her legacy be protected in this way. What more can you do to uh, ensure her legacy? Well, we, you, you need to have a body, academic body of work on her. You know, you have to have scholarship mm -hmm. on the art, and we have other people are writing about it now. And now the New York Gallery, Sotheby's, and they'll sell paintings of hers. But also, uh, we 
watch very carefully, even small, we have Google alerts on, the, on her way, and we see a painting, we saw one recently in somewhere in New Mexico, or Arizona, and it was a fake one. And we have the ability to call the FBI, and they will go look at the painting, and if it's fake, they'll take, take it down. Wow. We have the authority to do that. Right. We have brought, and, and this is not just Clementine, it's the whole world, art world is benefiting from this, because we have brought law enforcement into protecting self-taught art and folk art. It's, it's, it's a major accomplishment, not for me, but for the whole community that we've done this. Sure, sure, and they were doing this work for the, the trained artists that had already been going on, right. but not necessarily the folk art levels. Yes. Now, Tom, you're a prolific collector of Clementine's work. Do you have a favorite piece? Uh, as we sit in this gallery of yours at your home, you have pieces all around us, and I'm so enjoying this, it's gonna be hard to leave, but what's your, your favorite piece? Uh, I have several pieces that are favorite. Some she painted for me specifically, okay. but then there are some that I've acquired by gifts people have given to me that Williams family or the Britton family gave me. And the one I think is probably my favorite is Uncle Israel and Aunt Jane. They were the two last of the enslaved people at Melrose. Uncle Israel didn't die in 1825. And it's a picture of him and it's a painting of, the cat, of them outside their cottage. And it's so many, cult, not only artistic, but cultural. I don't know if you ever remember, I lived in the country. There were chicken coops where they had these, right. you know, and they, they shooed the chickens under them at night and they'd get them out in the daytime and they'd shoo them back so the fox wouldn't get him. Well, there, this has got the chicken coops in and that has completely disappeared from art. This, her documentation of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's just important to think that Clementine knew an enslaved person. Right. I mean, she, that was, that's pretty, she was a and, grown and she, woman. And she painted them. Yes, she yes. She was able to capture yes. them through her work. From life. I mean, they, they didn't pose for them, but she knew them in person. Right. How many, or I guess there are other artists that's done that, but still, gosh, that's amazing. That is, and of, of all of her pieces, and I, I loved how you said earlier that uh, she knew all the persons in her paintings. Yes. She, she had, could tell you who right. they were, who she was actually drawing. Right. And we talked about how she would oftentimes make the men smaller than the women. Uh, uh, very frequently. <laughs> all, all, and the smallest one was always the preacher. Oh, really? The she smallest? Had the, she all, in a painting, if there's involved a church scene, the preacher is always the smallest character. She had at least a, a respect for the minister. That's interesting. That's really interesting. <laughs> she was always the smallest person was a preacher. So what do you want to tell the next generation of artists and art historians and art enthusiasts about Clementine and her work? I what think do you want that them they, to know? I think yeah. they need to understand that Clementine painted from memory or from actually participating in it actual experiences that very few insiders have ever documented on canvas. These people didn't have access to paint mm -hmm. early, or her age group, that didn't. And uh, she painted from memory and she knew these people. She knew people that had been enslaved. And uh, this is all uh, part of the story that Clementine actually had insiders. She knew the people. She actually painted people she knew that had been slaves. And the community of the church, and I don't know about every place, but here, there are two communities on Cane River. There's, there are three. There's Anglo, white, there's the Creole community, and there's mm -hmm. the black community. Right. And there's some intermixing down all through there. It's a complicated story. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the idea that these people coexisted and the baptized, whenever there's a baptism on the river, that you know that's a Baptist one. So the Catholics didn't do it. So, you know, you have to figure out what's doing what. That's right. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a cultural milieu out share America, at Melrose. Think mm -hmm. about that. There were three communities separately culturally identifiable. Mm -hmm. When there were segregated schools, there were three separate schools out there. The white school was public, the black school was public, and then there was a Creole school that was Catholic. Interesting. It was a community of diversity. And you know, you have to think that diversity makes a difference. Makes a difference and then Clementine captured all of this and we want the young yeah. artists coming along to understand how important it is, I guess, to use your art uh, to capture what's going on around you at the time. She didn't have access to cameras, she couldn't write stories, but her paintings told from that insider's perspective what the subject, her life was like. Mm -hmm. That's unusual. Every aspect of her life, that's what's so amazing about her work as Think well. She, she, she covered cotton. everything. And you know, she tells me, she, one of her favorite scenes to paint was picking cotton. That would be the horriblest thing in my life. She said it was the favorite time of her life. It's hard it would, work. If they would all go down the road and they'd sing songs and they'd put their babies up in a bramble up on a tree. So then they'd go back down and come back down and check on the babies and go back down the road and pick again. Hmm. You know, it's just, an, it's just a lifestyle that no longer exists. Oh, clearly, clearly. So Tom, you've, you've accomplished so much in your life. Where do you get this energy from and, and what fuels you? Well, I, I think interesting people. That's a good answer. 
I had a lot of experiences at Northwestern when I worked here. I was chairman of the lecture series for 25 years. I had some of the great people in America come here and speak. Uh -huh. Brought him to Nashville when I retired, they quit the lecture series. But uh, the idea was that, you know, we had Margaret Mead, we had uh, Buckminster Fuller, Bill Russell visited here. Mm -hmm. And he came, he flew into Shreveport at six in the morning, I picked him up, wow. came back to my house, he said, he didn't speak till 10 o'clock. He said, can I take a nap? I said, well, I don't care. He piled up in my king size bed and took a nap for about an hour and a half, got up, took a shower and went to speak. And then we went to lunch and I cannot tell you how many meat pies he ate. He is people like a that. Very tall man. Yeah, yes. big man. Yes. He had a lot of place for meat pies. Yes. But you know, we had all Margaret Mead uh, uh -huh. was fascinating speaker. Yes. Uh, we, opportunity to work with the lecture series, uh -huh. and only one person, Miss Betty Friedan, threw her boots at me. But other than that, uh, it was it was a great experience. Did you say something to her? That well, made her she throw was. The boots? Well, no, I gave her a cocktail and she calmed down. I gave her a strong drink and she calmed down in the restaurant. <laughs> The, probably the most two amazing speakers were Maya Angelou and Coretta Scott King. I would imagine. Would we had we had so many. We had to, to have it at the Coliseum because it was so big. Sure. And, and they put all the, they, they bring school kids and they sat on the floor. All these little kids sitting on pallets or something. And she spoke and there was not a not a whisper in the building. And she did the poem about. And uh, it was just an, I've had experiences like that. So Tom, were you the one actually? Uh, deciding who the speakers were going well, to be. Well, I had a committee, but the committee the... basically deferred to me. The okay, committee then, basically deferred to and me. And then making the contacts. Oh, I, we just went to an agent. Wow. And okay. certain people, the agent was Los Angeles, and yeah. sometimes you, you don't want that person. That was always a sign of death to me. If the agent didn't want to try to get somebody, okay. that was a bad sign. Okay. Uh, okay. But we went through a great period of lecture series, and when mm -hmm. I retired, it went away. <laughs> wow. When you think back over your life and work, Tom, what are the what are you most proud of? You've done a lot. And I've done a lot, and I had even mentioned in this discussion, I've traveled a lot. I've been to all seven continents, and I've, I've really made trips, and I don't get on, I've never been on a group tour. I always go independent travel. Somebody really? goes with me, maybe. But I mean, I'll travel with, I go independent, and go places and do things, and you know, it's, it's seeing other people is very, I don't want to go on a trip with all Americans on a boat or something, I don't like that. So uh, that's what I want to do. I want to do, I have experiences. Life is experiences. Life's experiences, experiencing yeah. life doing some of it through travel. Wow. Every people interacting with interesting people. Yes. And Clementine, of course, that's kind of the premier stop is pulling with all that out there at the Cane River. Sure. So it's a it's a life well lived and it's a life that enjoyed I read, I think I understood what creativity was and interesting people and that made it a very enriching experience. So in all of these enriching experiences and and life in general, is there anything you do differently? No, probably not. I probably do more. Do but, more? Uh, yes, more, more. <laughs> more but of no. all the things you've done Yeah, already. I like more of it, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep, you got plenty more to go. I think you, I you, you're so. going to find I some more so. things to, to get yourself involved in. Thank you. Yes. That was good. I love it. So one last thing. What does the, the next chapter look like for you? Well, I'm do, I've, I've written a book or two about Clementine involved with projects on that. Mm -hmm. But I enjoy life. I want, I've been having some health issues. I haven't traveled, but I want to get back to traveling. Mm -hmm. you know, I got lots of frequent flyer miles I need to use. Okay, yeah, okay. That, that's a start. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just that uh, you want it, you want it many, uh, life is experiences, and I like experiences. Yeah. What about any other artists, any new artists, emerging artists you're seeing out there that you uh, have, I a, don't, have your eye on? I don't feel comfortable in that doing that because I don't know the people. I know so much about Clementine, that insider's relationship, that I think I'd have trouble with other artists. I mean, I like art and stuff, but in the idea of in working with people like Clementine and getting involved, mm -hmm. I didn't, and the artist, I knew the artist and could tell the stories. Mm -hmm. And your favorite piece on Clementine, you talked about wanting that to be in the public. Well, public, public domain, wing. yeah. I've got other paintings of mine that are going in the public domain too. I've already given some, I'm giving more. Okay. They need to be shared with the public. We love it. Thank you. We love it. Tom, we've enjoyed this time at your home. We've enjoyed your hospitality. I certainly want to get the recipe to those brownies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got to right. do that before we leave. And so thank you so much again as our 2022 Louisiana legend. Uh, you'll always be a legend and the, and the legacy of Clementine Hunter that you are keeping alive will go on for years and years and years. I like to hear that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely.
For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.